My name is Jocelyn Ramirez, and I'm the chef and founder of plant-based food business here in Los Angeles called Todo Verde. And I started Todo Verde in 2015 because I wanted to still eat all the things that I felt and a lot of people in the plant-based community felt like we couldn't eat anymore um, because we had chosen to be plant-based. So I still wanted to take, you know, my abuelita's recipes, my family recipes and things that just felt nostalgic to many of us um, and create plant-based versions of them. And in fact, if you haven't checked it out yet, I did publish a cookbook last year called La Vida Verde and it has 60 plant-based recipes that you can check out. And we are going to be going through three of them today. If you have the book in front of you and you wanna jot down notes in it, we're gonna do the uh, Mexican brown rice or the arroz mexicano on page 94. And then literally turn a page, page uh, 90, 97, the frijoles negros or the black bean smash. If you've ever had our catering, we call it black bean smash. Um, and then of course, tortillas hechas a mano, which is on the next page. So it's back to back to back. And uh, it's it's funny because, um, you know, I, I do so many of these classes and my partner's like, oh, what are you cooking this weekend? And I was like, rice, beans, and tortillas. And he was like, okay, like whatevs, not, nothing too special. And I was like, what? this is like the foundation of a special dish, um, you know? So I, I had to kind of school him on how important like this, this trinity is to Mexican cuisine. Um, and so I'm so happy to share these dishes with you and my uh, little versions or slight variations of them that I think make them even more flavorful and exciting for us. So let's get into the first recipe, which is the arroz mexicano. And uh, we are going to be using brown rice, actually short grain brown rice. Uh, I'm using this short grain, where is the, it's London, Lundberg is the brand. Um, I just picked this up at my local grocery store literally this morning because I realized that I only had long grain like jasmine rice in my cupboard. Um, and I only use brown rice here at home. Uh, it's one of the things that I always talk about in, when I'm talking about trying to transition to more healthy whole foods is anything that you have in your cupboard that's white, white sugar, white flour, white rice. Um, uh, I would like to try to consume brown versions of those, brown rices, uh, wheat flours, uh, raw sugars, and things like that. Uh, just because they are healthier versions for us. However, I do understand that for a lot of cultures and communities, white rice is a staple. So no shame in the game there. It's just, I like to use brown rice uh, for these particular recipes. And I really like the short grain. The reason I had to go to the store this morning rather than using my long grain um, rice is that it just cooks a little bit differently. So the ratios will be just slightly off. I find that when I've made this recipe with the long grain rice, um, it actually uh, still stays a little bit crunchy even after the liquid has absorbed. Um, so I find myself having to add more and kind of at the end trying to kind of piece it together and make it work. Whereas for the short grain, I find that it just cooks perfectly. And I haven't used this brand specifically for this. So I, I'm gonna see, we're, we're gonna check out how it works out. Um, but I'll actually pull up the grains here up close so you can see. So we use a short grain rice for todo verde in our recipe. And these grains are actually super teeny tiny. They're little, little, like maybe a, a quarter of an inch, if that, um, in length. And we use one that's maybe just not double the size, but um, in length, but maybe just a little bit longer. So these are little, little itty bitty ones. Um, and so I'm excited to use these. And all I did was I measured out, this is one and three quarter cups of rice and I rinsed it thoroughly in a strainer. Um, and you can rinse it in a bowl and uh, pretty much you keep, you can keep rinsing until you feel like the water is not as cloudy anymore. So you're just trying to get any dirt debris off of it um, and make sure that it's nice and clean. So I have one and three quarter cups already rinsed. And then we're going to just lightly toast this or pan fry it in our pot. Um, but before I do that, I just want to talk about the things that are going to flavor it. So things that we typically see in a Mexican rice are, and I, and I want to stress here, 
that Mexican rice is different than Spanish rice. I think that that is something that I hear all the time, like, oh, Mexican rice, Spanish rice, <laughs> they look the same, uh, different sometimes different types of rices. Um, the, the type of Spanish rice that we see is typically more like paella and the coloring mostly comes from saffron versus tomato, uh, tomato base. And also they're using arborio rice, uh, which is different than the type of rice that we typically use in Mexico, which is more of a short grain white rice. Um, and so this is more of a tomato base um, and you could use fresh tomatoes if you wanted to, however, it will be a little bit different in flavor. I like the using um, a pre-made tomato sauce because I feel like the tomato flavor just kind of is more of a punch of flavor and fresh tomatoes will work. It'll, it'll kind of taste a little bit more like, a, like sopa de fideo kind of, right? Um, so this will give it a slightly different color and texture or uh, flavor and texture. So I have three quarters of a cup of my tomato sauce. This was just canned organic tomato sauce. And then I also am using some spices here. I have uh, one and a half teaspoons of crushed red pepper flakes. Of course, if you have like chile de arbol and you wanna break it up into you know little pieces and grind it down, you could use that, maybe not as much. I would probably do like half a teaspoon. And then I have here a half teaspoon of cumin and the cumin is gonna give me a nice little bit of depth of flavor. It's just ground cumin. It's gonna give me a, a nice little undertone for the dish. And then I have uh, two bay leaves. I got another little piece cause they were kind of broken. They're like the last of my batch. So it looks like three, but it's, it's kind of the equivalent of two. And I have a little bit of fresh cracked black pepper and then it's gonna be salt to taste. Now the salt that I'm gonna be using is going to be just a kosher flaky salt. If you have a uh, pink Himalayan salt or you know different uh, type of salt, they all have a wide variety of saltiness is to them, if that's the, word, the phrase that you would use. Um, and so it's hard, it's difficult for me to say exactly this much salt unless we're using the exact type of salt. So I'm gonna be using a kosher, I'll be, uh, probably adding like two to three pinches, tasting it, um, and, then, and then letting it cook off. And the liquids, the other liquids that I'm using in here, I know this is half a cup, but this is gonna be for the beans and the rice, but you're gonna use a quarter cup of cooking oil. The type of cooking oil that I prefer to use here at home is grapeseed oil. I just find that it can uh, take heat a little bit better. It has a higher smoke point. Um, and it's pretty neutral in flavor, so it won't overpower anything. And, uh, and, and it, just, it just works very nicely. For todo verde, we use a rice bran oil. You can definitely use um, a vegetable, canola, avocado oil. Um, I have made this with extra virgin olive oil. It's fine, um, but it's a more expensive um, product to use for something that you're cooking. And maybe even slightly burning because it doesn't have as high of a, of a smoke point. So you're gonna have a quarter cup of that oil that you'll be using to pan fry. So we'll start off with these two. And then once this is nice and toasted, we'll introduce our vegetable broth. And I have here two and three quarter cups of vegetable broth and I'm stirring it because I'll show you the product that I use to make this. Um, not that I'm plugging it, but it, I just think it's a little bit of a time saver sometimes if you don't have that whole container of vegetable broth in your fridge or in your cupboard. I like to use this better than bouillon base. And essentially a teaspoon of this paste to a cup of hot water ends up being a cup of vegetable broth. So they have vegetable, chicken base, a few different, diff uh, different bases. And it's just really convenient to just have this small little container that will end up being the equivalent of who knows how many, I'm sure it says in here how many it ends up being cups of 38 servings. So this is 38 cups of vegetable broth as compared to those cartons that we get. So this will uh, definitely last a little bit longer. So let's head over to the stove. I'm going to preheat a pot. And the other thing I will say about this is I like to use a pot that's not too big. So I'm using the smaller pot on my front burner. It's probably gonna be like filled all the way. Um, but the reason I don't like to use like the big pot back here for rice is I just find that when it's more spread out um, and you're not making a ton of it, 
that it kind of, uh, the liquid evaporates a whole lot faster and it kind of dries out a little bit faster. And so the cooking is a little bit off and in a smaller pot, it's more contained. So I just prefer to use, um, you know, a small to medium pot for this. And we'll see how filled up it gets. I, I'm always like concerned about this. Even when we're in the kitchen with all the red, they're like, is that pot too small? And then you pour the rice in and you're like, wow, you were, you were tripping. It's definitely not too small. <laughs> so I am going to, I have this on at about like a medium low heat. And I'm just going to pour in my quarter cup of oil. Let me measure that out and do another little dash there. Okay, so I have my quarter cup of oil that went in. And I just want that to get nice and warm. And you'll be able to tell if it's if it's hot, if it's moving really quickly in your in your pan. And sometimes you see a little bit of like this iridescent sheen in it. Um, also, the test is you could throw in a grain of rice or you can just wet your fingertips and splash a little bit of water in there. And if you hear that sizzle on the on the um, oil, it's hot. Now, make sure you have if you haven't measured everything out before you start this and you're cooking along, make sure you have your liquids measured out. Your, ve your vegetable broth and your tomato sauce should be ready to go so that as soon as this is done, you just immediately pour in those liquids. So I'm just gonna grab a wooden spoon and I'm going to just gently, cause this oil is hot, pour in my rice. And this is uh, something that you, you want to kind of stick with here in the kitchen. You don't want to walk away and be like, oh, let me try to wash some dishes or do some other stuff in the kitchen. You want to pretty much stay here. This is even like, I'm like getting all stressed because it's taking forever to get all that rice out. And so what I want to do is I want to just stay here and just keep mixing this rice here in the oil. So I'm just pan frying and it'll be, I'll be here for a few minutes. And what I'm trying to do is I'll start to see the color adjust. It'll start to turn a nice toasty brown. I mean, it's already brown rice, but you'll, you'll definitely see a little bit of a color difference there. And then I'll also be able to smell the aromatic rice becoming this nice toasty fragrance. So I had it on a little bit too high right now. I'm probably on a like a two to three dial on my stove but now it's getting too low. So I'll turn it back up a little bit. I'm probably now like at a four. And each of our dials are a little bit different. I'm just below medium. So just in case yours is like different numbers, I'm like just below medium. And I'm gonna be here still for a few minutes. And of course we rinse this rice. So there is some moisture in here. And that moisture is either absorbing into the rice, slightly evaporating as this, you know, toasting process happens. And this is very similar to what we do for sopa de fideo, right? For the fideo, we also toast the, the noodles or the pasta uh, and it gives it a nice uh, bit of flavor. It definitely feels a bit different than when you just um, have the rice that's rinsed and you just add all the liquids and just boil it and cook it that way. Um, this just adds another little depth of flavor to the dish. So it's an important step. I wouldn't skip this step. Um, I haven't tried to do this in an Instapot because I've been finding that I, I cook a lot of brown rice for just bowls. Like I'll, I'll do bowls with like roasted veggies and stuff like that. And I use my Instapot a lot. And I know it does have a feature where you could you know, kind of sear and sizzle things slightly, um, but that's to be determined if it's a good fit for this particular dish. And it's starting to smell really yummy in here. Really, really good. I can see at the bottom that I'm getting a nice sizzle and you can also look at where are your hot spots? Like your hot spot might be, for me, it's right here. I can see all the oil sizzling right here. And on this side, not so much. It, it is, but not as much as this side. So just keep an eye on your hot spot and make sure that nothing is staying there for a long period of time where it's going to um, toast a whole lot more there and not evenly cook or evenly toast throughout. And that's what happens is like sometimes if you walk away 
the bottom is going to get super nice and toasty, but the top area or whatever's not touching the oil or the heat source is not going to toast. Um, and so you're going to have kind of uneven cooking. So you just need to be here to make sure that it's all kind of staying, staying on the same level here. All right, I'm just going to give this maybe another minute and then I'm going to add my liquids. I'd love to answer any questions if you do have any questions. And oh, I could move this a little bit this way. Sorry about that. All right. Feel free to also mention like, hey, we can't see that. I can definitely adjust. All right, we are almost there. So let's see if we can see a slight difference in the color. This has a little window in it. You can see that is the color of the rice uncooked. And then that is a color cooked, which it's a little bit of a difference. You see a little bit more of a golden brown in the rice in the pot. It's not gonna be a huge difference. I think you'll be able to see the, um, the not I think, I know you're able to see the browning happen more on white rice, not as much on brown rice, but you can still see it. Okay, and you'll also start to see a little bit of like opaqueness in some of the um, the pieces of rice, the grains of rice, as they get nice and uh, toasty on the outside, they'll turn a little bit opaque. All right, so I am going to start working on introducing my liquids here. Now, it's going to sizzle and splatter. I'm gonna just turn my heat down slightly and just mix this for like another 30 seconds just to try to, I mean, it's not gonna cool it down completely, but it's just not gonna be as, as hot so that I don't have as much of that sizzling or splattering that happens, especially since this isn't a huge pot. All right. Yes, that's looking nice and toasty. You can see there the browning that's happened, the little bit of opaque color that I mentioned. I can get in a little closer there. So you can see. And so I am going to go ahead and add my tomato sauce. So this is three quarter cups of tomato sauce that I'm gonna add in here. And then I have, I'm just going to add my um, my vegetable broth into this cup to get all of it. I have two and three quarter cups of this vegetable broth that's going in and I'm just cleaning the glass just to get every little last bit of it. You can see it's getting nice and bubbly right there. Hey Jocelyn, we have a question. Sure. How many fresh tomatoes makes three fourths of a cup? And does it matter which tomatoes we use? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's kind of hard to say how many exactly. I would say if you use like one to two really um, medium to large globe tomatoes, I think that might yield what you need. Um, and then I would use, um, I personally like using globe or, um, let me see if I have some. Oh, I do have some. So like this is a globe tomato, right? So this is my personal preference of like the favorite type of tomato. They're also called beef steak. Um, and the riper, the better, the more flavor they will have. So you want that tiny bit of sugar and sweetness that, that uh, tomatoes have. So I think if I were to use like two of these, I, I would yield um, three quarters of a cup of that tomato sauce. And it's not gonna be as um, dense, you know, as the, um, as the uh, to, the tomato canned tomato that you get, uh, but it's still it's still gonna be good. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and drop in those spices. So that was one and a half teaspoons crushed red pepper flakes, half a teaspoon of cumin, two bay leaves, some pepper, and then of course I need some salt in here. So I'm going to grab my my salt and add a few pinches, a few generous pinches. Let me add another one. And then I'm gonna stir it 
And I'm gonna just give it a taste to see if the, I mean, you'll be able to taste if the liquid um, needs a little bit of salt. I'd rather do that now than wait towards the end once the rice is cooked, because of course it's gonna absorb all this liquid and you want that, um, that grain of each grain to be super flavored. I'm gonna add a touch more salt. I love salt by the way. So you might be like, OMG girl, you're adding so much salt. Um, I just think it's, it enhances the flavors in here and just makes everything really marry super well. Let me give it another taste. That tastes great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just transfer this to my back burner because this needs to cook for about 45 minutes. And obviously we're gonna be cooking other things. So I just wanna out of the way. I'm gonna turn on that back burner and I'm going to turn it to about like a medium low again, just under medium. I'm going to remove the spoon. I already mixed everything together and I'm going to just set the jar on uh, the jar, the lid on a jar, <laughs> if that makes sense. You know, a jar means like it's not sealed all the way that it has a little breathing room. Um, and then once this starts to uh, come up in temperature, if it's boiling a lot, I'm going to bring it down and I, I want it to just simmer. So uh, once it comes up, cause obviously that liquid was not super hot. So uh, I'll give it a few minutes to see what it's looking like. And I'm like, okay, if, it, if it's uh, not simmering yet, um, then I'll turn up the heat slightly and I want it to get nice and hot and then keep cooking it at a simmer for the 45 minutes. I'm also gonna set a timer, really important here. And what I like to do for my timer is also check it at the, about the 30 minute mark. So when my timer is down, um, and you can't see my timer, but I'm just using the one on my stove here at 45 minutes. So when that's down to about 15 minutes left, I'll check it and see if, you know, there's anything, you know, maybe I'm like, oh, wow, it hasn't been simmering enough or there's still a bunch of the liquid left in there and it hasn't evaporated. I'll slightly turn up the heat and let that come to a, a little bit higher of a simmer. Um, still not quite a boil, a full rolling boil, um, but I just wanna make sure that it has enough of that hot temperature to finish it um, in time for the 45 minute mark. So that's on the back burner and we'll let that just go until we're um, uh, closer to seeing that completed dish. And on my front burner, I'm just going to preheat a bigger pot and Sorry, this pot is gonna be much bigger than what I actually need, but I literally only have these two pots at home. <laughs> so I have a, a small pot and a big one. And so this is what's going to work for, um, for our beans. So I'm just gonna turn that on to like a, a low heat, um, just so it can start preheating. And I can also throw in, I have a quarter cup of oil, same oil, the grapeseed oil that I'm just going to pour into that pot and let that just come to temperature. And let's talk about the, the beans. So we'll come back here. And so we're using black beans for this dish. And I love using black beans because I find that, you know, the color is so beautiful, um, especially when you puree it and it ends up being a, like a charcoal color which I find really beautiful, especially if you make tostadas. I recently made um, tostadas de mushroom tinga. Um, tinga is a, a dish typically made with chicken that has chipotle, tomatoes, onion, garlic. And so it has this kind of like a red hue to it. And I made it with mushrooms and I had black beans on the on a tostada uh, topped with that. So it's just the layers of color that look really interesting to me. Um, and so these are kind of my go-tos. I, of course, love eating pinto beans, mayacoba beans, also known as peruanos. Um, there's so many varieties of beans that you can use for this dish. We're using the black beans. So I have three cups. And if you, um, one thing that I recommend, if you're cooking your fresh beans yourself from dry to cooked, um, typically you want to soak your beans for a few hours up to overnight and then put them, uh, some people drain that soaking liquid, some people use it. I've heard uh, a, a famous chef, her name is Samin Nosrat. She had a show on Netflix called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat and also wrote a book. Um, actually the show is based on the book, but anywho, I've heard her talk about 
cooking beans. Um, and she said something really funny, which was like, oh, a lot of people like to drain the, that soaking liquid out because that's where all the farts are. Um, and I thought that was so funny. Um, I'm just laughing by myself here. Everybody else is muted, but it's, uh, but I still am fine with using that cooking liquid and adding more to it. So just rinse your beans really well before you soak them and then use that cooking liquid or that soaking liquid to cook. And obviously you'll need to add more. Uh, and you can cook your beans for several hours. A couple hours usually does the trick. And what I also like to add to my beans when they're cooking is I add other aromatics. I add bay leaves. Sometimes I add avocado leaves. I add um, chiles. I might add like a, a dry chipotle or two. Uh, sometimes I will add dry mushrooms to it. Just things that will enhance the flavor of the beans as they're you know cooking up all that uh, in that delicious broth. Just adding any aromatics that you prefer will make them delicious. Now, however, for this dish, we're still going to add more spices to it, even though they've already cooked in, in something, right, that has given them a little bit of that flavor. It's just going to make this particular dish even more flavorful. So I have my three cups of black beans that have been pre-cooked, um, and so they're already edible but we're going to just cook them a little bit more with a little bit more uh, liquid. You could use vegetable broth like we have here, or if you did cook these from scratch, you could absolutely use the liquid that you use to cook them in. So up to you, um, but here we're using vegetable broth. I know some people are probably gonna be using canned beans and that's totally okay too. So three cups of the beans and we, are, we have one cup of broth. And then the spices are super similar because uh, we're trying to like make a dish that, you know, it has different flavors, but they're all kind of seasoned the, similarly. So the notes are, are it kind of ties everything together. So here, let me, ooh, and I pan down a little too much. There we go. Let me open up to this page just to make sure I'm looking at the seasoning properly. I have half a teaspoon of cumin. So same amount of, uh, sorry, I have half a teaspoon of crushed red pepper flakes. So the crushed red pepper flakes are a little bit less than what we used in the rice dish. Um, but just to give a little hint of spiciness, again, you could absolutely use chile de árbol. And then I have a half teaspoon of ground cumin. And so again, giving that nice kind of um, foundational flavor, that back note, that's gonna give a nice depth to the dish. I have one bay leaf here and I have some uh, freshly ground black pepper. And again, it's gonna be salt to taste. If you are using canned beans that were already salted, um, sometimes they're a little bit more salty than the types of beans you might cook yourself, uh, the la olla. So just be mindful of the salt and um, taste your beans and see if they already feel fairly salty. And then you can always, um, this one, I feel more comfortable saying you can add salt even as uh, towards the end process versus like the rice. I really want each grain of rice to be flavored really nicely. So let's head back over to the stove. And this is gonna be super easy. We're literally just throwing everything in the pot and letting it simmer for 10, 15 minutes. So we're gonna throw in, and the oil's nice and hot, or nice and warm, I would say. I wouldn't say it's super hot. We have our three cups of beans. Jocelyn, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can I use the uh, bean cooking liquid as the broth? Yes, absolutely. So we were just talking about that. I would say yes, feel free to do that. It's going to taste even more like the, the beans and the aromatics that you put in there. So you can absolutely use that one cup of bean broth versus vegetable broth. And is the mash that we're making similar to refried beans that they serve in restaurants? Uh, I would say ours are going to be probably a little bit smoother. Um, so it's like, it feels even a little bit more spreadable. I guess it depends per restaurant, right? Uh, it's slightly different per restaurant, but yeah, it'll be a little bit like a refried beans. Um, we have the oil in here that's going, which gives it that nice kind of like fatty texture to it as well. Um, and then the, ours are definitely going to be smooth, smooth, smooth. I like to really, uh, blitz these until they're nice and smooth versus refried beans sometimes have a little bit of texture still left to them. So we're going to add our spices, our aromatics here. And I'm just going to use the spoon to mix everything together. And I like to make sure my bay leaf 
is like tucked into the bottom to, in, in the liquid. So make sure it's not sitting on top that it's actually like tucked in. So my bay leaf is like nowhere to be found because it's like buried under that little pile of beans right there tucked at the bottom. And we are going to just let this cook and simmer for about 15 minutes. I'm turning it up slightly to like a medium, uh, just under medium here. And I'm going to also set this lid on a jar. And then let's check out how much my rice is boiling. Look at that. So it's definitely on a rolling boil right now. And so I don't want it to cook like this the whole time. I want it to simmer. So I'm gonna drop the heat a little bit. So I was just under medium and I'm dropping it like a couple notches down because I don't want it to um, have the liquid evaporate but not cook the rice all the way through. So I'm looking for a simmer, but at least I know now it's hot, which is what I'm looking for too. I want it to get hot and now I know it's hot and I'm going to just turn it down to simmer. So that'll take a, a couple minutes to just kind of mellow out slightly, but I could already see that it's starting to slightly mellow. Okay. And I'll keep checking on that just to make sure that I have that simmer that I'm looking for. So let's come back to the main screen here. And we are going to get into tortillas, talking about all things tortillas as those things cook. And, um, and then we'll start cooking tortillas. So the beans have to be done because I'm only using two burners on my stove. I guess I could move some things, but um, once the beans are done, we'll start cooking the tortillas. But let's talk about masa right now. And if you have the book in front of you, we're on page 98. And so I'm gonna talk about just masarina and the types of things that you, uh, types of brands uh, and things to look out for when you're buying masarina. So I'm just going to pan down. This is the only thing I have not measured, which I didn't mention earlier. Um, we're gonna be using two cups of masarina. The only reason I didn't measure it is because I just wanted to show you how I measure it and it's, it seems super silly, but it makes all the difference. Um, but I'll talk about that in a second. First of all, I wanna just share with you some of the brands I have here at home. Uh, and I know I'm, I'm not trying to like plug these brands, but I'm just also letting you know like which ones I think ha have a better quality to them. Um, so this is the one that we use a lot with Todo Verde. And we also sell in some of our kits. It's a, a golden organic masarina made by Bob's Red Mill, AKA the grain gangster as they call him. And I mean, they sell a variety of different grains. Masarina is one of them. And one thing that you want to look out for here is that the ingredients, whether it's this brand or others, in that it's just literally corn and hydrated lime or trace of lime is what you're looking for. Those two ingredients. Here I have a gold gold mine. Um, this is a white masarina, whereas this one is a golden or yellow corn. This one is white. Um, and again, flipping it over, the ingredients are literally organic white corn, trace of lime. That's it. Here I have Masienda, which is one of the more popular high-end brands of masarina. This is, excuse me, also a white corn. And I believe the ingredients are on the front for this one. Uh, Non-GMO heirloom corn, premium, trace of lime. So all that to show you that, uh, you know, there are a variety of different brands that you can look to for making tortillas or tamales, but you should make sure that they only have those two ingredients in, um, in the um, ingredient list because there's others out there and they have preservatives and flavors and, and things that essentially for me feel like they don't really um, amplify the favorite flavor of the corn. It starts to kind of uh, taste like other things. So one of the, the, the key ones that I always encourage people not to use is Maseca, which is the one that you probably see at, um, at a commercial level at more than any of the others. It's at most Mexican grocery stores. Uh, people usually have it in their cupboards and, and it has so many preservatives in it. Um, it. It tastes a little bit for me, a little bit sour, um, if that makes sense. Um, and the flavor for me is just not there. So, you know, I, I like to focus on some that really, um, focus on just the corn itself and, and making sure that they have a delicious corn product. Now, the other thing that I'll say about different um, masarina varieties. So if you're not familiar with, with masarina, this is different. Like I've had people who ask the question, can I use cornmeal? I don't have masarina, can I use cornmeal instead or corn flour? 
And the answer is no, if you want a true tortilla. The reason being is that, you know, all of these had trace of lime or hydrated lime or something like that in the second ingredient. And that essentially is a calcium limestone. It's, it's what, um, what is used for this process that we do with corn for tortillas and tamales, which is called nixtamal in Mexico. And what nixtamal does is uh, it's, uh, you use the calcium limestone to essentially soak the corn for several hours, typically overnight. And that uh, helps to remove the outer skin or the outer shell of the corn so that it makes it more digestible and so that you can um, you know, easily cook this and break it down. And folks say that it makes it more nutritious and so on and so forth. It just makes a better product. Whereas cornmeal um, and corn flour don't necessarily go through that process. It's literally just the ground up corn. Um, so this will be different. If you were making corn uh, or sorry, tortillas or tamales directly from the nixtamal process, then it would it would look something along the lines of like, you know, you have this like sopping wet corn that's uh, soaked in the nixtamal mixture and you have to rinse it thoroughly and also remove like the outer skin of the corn. Uh, so usually that requires like some agitation, like people will put it in between their hands and like rub it with uh, fresh water to remove that outer skin of the corn. And, uh, and then you can grind that corn with a mill uh, and some water and you'll have tortillas. So, you know, it's, it's really a long process. This, these brands have already done that for us. So all we literally have to do is add hot water to reactivate the corn that has already gone through the Nistamal process. So, and the other thing that I'll mention is if you are Los Angeles based, there is a really great company um, that I personally, I love the flavor and uh, of, their, of their products. It's called uh, Kernel Truth Organics. And they're based here in Boyle Heights um, and they use non-GMO organic corn and they sell uh, yellow and blue corn tortillas and masarina. In fact, I think I have some of their um, masarina that I, yes, I do. I have some of their masarina. I think I have some of their like frozen blue corn tortillas, which tortillas FYI freeze really well. So I have their kernel truth blue corn tortillas. I have their yellow corn masarina and they only sell these at kind of a, a, a few places. It's kind of a exclusive thing. It's not at every grocery store. They sell it at Cookbook Market in Highland Park, Echo Park, Sarah's Market in City Terrace, and uh, Grassroots Market in South Pasadena. So if you're ever in those areas, you either want to pick up um, the masa. I think they only they don't sell the, the masa at Grassroots, but they do sell the yellow corn tortillas at Grassroots um, in a bigger, much bigger package than this. So. If you're ever in a pinch and you're in that, those areas and want to pick those up, I highly recommend Kernel of Truth. They're, uh, they're a great brand to work with. Let me take a quick look at how things are looking over here before we get into. So now I can see that I'm on a, at a nice simmer here on my back burner with my rice. So I, I just want to keep that going. And right now I'm at the 29 minutes left mark. Um, so when we get closer to 15 minutes left, I'll check it again to see how that cooking process is going. And my front um, burner with the beans is definitely um, cooking up a storm here. So what I'm doing in this process is I'm essentially kind of overcooking the beans. You're getting the beans really soft. And also with these aromatics, they're becoming uh, uh, more condensed in the flavor than you than the big old pot of beans. I'm just going to lower the heat slightly because I don't need it to be boiling that crazy. And I'll just give these a few more minutes as we get our masa going. So coming back to this screen, uh, for the masa, I'm going to be using the Bob's Red Mill yellow corn. And the other thing I wanted to just uh, mention is I like to, for any flowers that I'm using, I like to pour my flour into my uh, measuring receptacle and do this and try to get whatever I need into that measuring receptacle um, rather than like what I think most of us typically do is we get this measuring cup and we stick it into the bag and we like are trying to scoop up as much of the um, masarina as we can to get that one cup or two cups or whatever it is 
And what you end up doing is you end up compacting your, um, your measurement. You end up grabbing more than one cup because it's like really smashed in there versus like this way, you're getting this like really nice, fluffy, airy um, one cup measurement here. Like you can see it's nice and light and airy. Whereas when you scoop in like that, you end up uh, getting more than one cup. And so that tends to create issues for, um, especially for baking, like, you know, it'll, you'll yield like dry cookies, dry cake, dry bread, um, because you're actually using a little bit more flour than the recipe calls for. And so it kind of dries everything out. So it's good to do this, or you can also use a spoon if it's a really big bag and like scoop with a spoon into your measuring receptacle. So I just wanted to show that it's nothing fancy, but it just is helpful if you want to try to stay more true to um, the cooking process. And then the other thing that I forgot to do is heat up my water. So let me go to my, I'm using a hot water kettle, so it'll be pretty fast. I just need to turn it on and let that come to temperature. And so the other thing that I'll say typically with masa harina, with going from dry to uh, a moist pliable masa harina, is that it's typically one to one ratio of masa harina to water. Now I know that the recipe here calls for a little extra water um, in the ingredients list. It says two to three cups because sometimes there is a variation. Like if you are in a really dry region, it's really hot and dry, then you might yield a more dry masarina that needs a bit more moisture. If you are in a humid area, if it's cold, um, there's like so many different factors. I think these are some of the same factors that bakers look to when they're baking bread, like the environment around them also impacts the way that the final product comes out. So typically it'll be one to one. However, I did add the extra cup just in case you need to kind of keep adding or if you're um, if you leave it and you don't use it right away and it kind of starts to dry out just because it's exposed to the air, you might need to hit it with a little bit more of that water to uh, loosen it up so that it becomes nice and pliable again. So that's just kind of a general rule of thumb, the one-to-one, -one. but tortillas are so finicky for a lot of people. Like it's even at restaurants where I know that they make their own masa, um, it, even if there's a recipe there, it's a lot of it has to do with like who's making it, uh, the temperature, is the corn hot, is it not that hot, is the water as hot as it's supposed to be, like all these things. And so it's hard to say like, this is exactly how you make it. A lot of it is like, you have to feel the, the, the masa, you have to feel it with your hands and be like, oh, it needs this or that. And I'll show you like a few um, tips and tricks. And so while that's heating up, the other thing that I do have is um, I'm j I like to add a little bit of a uh, drizzle of oil to my tortillas just to make them even more um, pliable. And um, but this is optional. Some people are like, you know, purists and they only want corn and water and that's fine. I like to add a little bit of oil to mine and I also like to add a little bit of salt um, just to kind of help the, the tortilla itself tastes delicious like you almost don't need to add anything on it and it's just like is a delicious treat <laughs> um so those are just things that I also like to add that I will be um adding to this recipe and lastly the other things that I do have is I'm going to be using a press to press tortillas but I'm also going to show you other ways to do that so um I like to use a tortilla press and I'll show you like why because <laughs> it saves so much time in your kitchen if if you really do love making handmade tortillas. I'm using here one that's uh, by this brand called Victoria. They're based in Colombia and you can use this for tortillas, arepas. I like using cast iron and, and stainless steel as you can see, just because I find that it's gonna be something that you have in your cupboard forever. Whereas like if you go to these Mexican grocery stores like Vallarta and Northgate and so on and so forth, you can find the aluminum ones, the metal looking ones. Sometimes they're like, um, a cheap metal and they're like painted with a <laughs> with another color. Um, but I just find that um, I have uneven tortillas sometimes, like sometimes they'll be a lot thicker on one side and thinner on the other, or um, those products get really rusty quickly. So if you wanna clean them, they get super rusty. So after, you know, a couple of years they become trash. And so I'd rather have one where it's like, I know I'm gonna have this for a lifetime and I just have to take care of it. 
um, versus the other the other ones that I've seen out there. Um, if you don't have a tortilla press, what you could grab now is either two cutting boards. Um, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna demo on my cooking serve, on my um, countertop, which is all one piece of stone. But if you have grout, definitely get like a, a cutting board on the bottom and then another cutting board on top. Or alternatively, if you wanna see, like if your cutting board is probably not clear, it's maybe like wood or something, then you could use a baking dish. Where is mine? Here is mine. So you could use like a, one of these like clear baking dishes so that you can see what the tortilla is looking like below. And the reason I say a baking dish and not a plate is because a baking dish is gonna be a, a thicker. Um, and so there's like less likelihood that you're gonna put your weight on it and break it where I'm, you know, I'd be concerned about that with the regular cooking plate. So I have my two cups of masa in that. Let me grab my hot water and let's start working on this masa. Would you say gonna... never, never to use a rolling pin to make the tortillas? Uh, that's a great question. I've never used a rolling pin. I imagine that you might have a little bit of a sticking because usually when you use a rolling pin, you add a little bit of additional flour to roll so that there's no sticking. Whereas a tortilla, you wouldn't have that. So, you know, what I'm using here is gonna be two pieces of wax paper to press down. You could use parchment. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people use plastic. So you just could use a bag that you cut to create kind of two layers to sandwich. And this prevents the sticking from happening. Thank you. Of course, thank you. That's a great question. Okay, so I'm gonna pan down. So I have my two cups of masarina and I'm gonna use the same measuring cup to measure two cups. And let me actually create a little well here. I'm gonna create two or pour in two cups of hot water. So there's one cup. Let me get a second cup. And then, and then I would say mix see how it's looking, you're gonna give it a little bit of time before you decide if you wanna add any additional liquid. So only start with the, the correct ratio, which is the one to one, right? And then even if you are, like I said, in a dry hot area, still do the one to one, mix it, give it a few minutes to um, for that water to fully absorb into the rehydrating masarina. And if you then see, oh, wow, this is still very dry. I need to add more after a couple minutes of it kind of like uh, getting fully mixed and then resting, then you can add more liquid. But I wouldn't add it now. I wanna try to get it worked in. I like to use a spatula here because I, I can easily kind of scrape the bottom. You can use a wooden spoon. Um, once it becomes a little bit more um, cool to the touch, I will use my hands. But right now it's obviously it was you know boiling hot water you don't want to do that right away unless you have abuelita hands then then by all means which is like grandmother hands you know some of us have that um my mom could just probably go in here and be like oh she'd be like oh, oh okay and then just start going you know okay so i'm just making sure that any dry areas that i see of um dry masarina that are that they are getting worked in to the masa, so they're not staying super dry. And what I'm going to do at this point, since I see that it's all kind of coming together pretty nicely, is I'm also going to add my little drizzle of olive oil. Oh, sorry, olive oil, cooking oil, not olive oil. Olive oil might for me might be a too a little bit too strong of a flavor here. So for my cooking oil, I have a quarter cup total. I'm just gonna eyeball like a, a tablespoon or two. And you can always add more if you want to. But again, this is a little bit about like feeling it out, feeling it out, like does it need a little bit more water or oil? And so the oil makes it feel a little bit uh, pliable. It gives it a, um, a Aside from the pliability, it gives it kind of like a little bit of like a sheen that um, helps it get like just a slight little crisp on the comal as well too, just like a little bit of that. So I can see that mine got a little bit shiny and I'm trying to work that oil in. 
And I'm also going to add here my little pinch of salt. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of salt. Just a nice generous pinch, not a lot. And I will work that in. And so at this point, once you're kind of here with me and getting this all mixed together, what I would do is just set it aside for a moment and we're gonna go back to check on how our beans are doing for just a second, cause that's already been at least 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll come back to this masa, which is still, mine is steaming. So it's not ready for my hands to enter yet. You can cover it. Like if you don't want it to dry out, you can just put a towel over it or your plastic or your wax paper. Um, and just set it aside and let me go back and check to see how our beans are doing. So let me grab another towel here to remove the lid. All right, so my beans, at this point, they should be extremely soft. I'm gonna turn off the heat. Let me grab a spoon here. I'll actually grab a spatula because I'll need a spatula afterwards once they become sort of a, a paste. What I'm gonna do is remove my um, bay leaf. And this bay leaf is nice and soft now because it's been cooking here for 10 minutes. It's done its, its job so you can compost it, you can toss it, just remove it. It's no longer needed in this dish. Unless you're using a high power blender and are okay blending your bay leaf into the mix mixture. Um, so we, we're either gonna use a handheld immersion blender or a, a, a regular blender to blend this until it's a nice smooth paste. And if you find that you need, maybe your, some of your liquid has um, really evaporated and you need a little bit more liquid, you can always add a little bit more of your bean liquid, your bean cooking liquid, your vegetable broth, or even a little dash of water to help loosen it up as needed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, I'm gonna be using a hand immersion blender, which is this tool here. It's a Cuisinart. I have this on hand just because it's one, uh, easier tool to use rather than a blender. And I like to start it on low, temp, uh, low, uh, just low, I guess, <laughs> so that it uh, doesn't splatter all over the place and it'll just blend up the beans. So you can just kind of go around and you can start to blend up the beans. And this is kind of a nice perk of having the big pot here is that some of the splatter is just staying in the pot so you're not getting yourself because this is hot. And you want to do this when this is when this is hot. It doesn't need to be, you know, boiling hot, but you don't want this to, you know, be in the fridge and then you blend it because you'll likely need a little bit more liquid because the beans are going to kind of slightly harden. When that closed my back pot there, the vibration here closed the back lid. Let me just open that up. All right. So I'm just gonna keep blending this up until I get a nice smooth paste. Now that I've gotten a nice little bit of a, of a paste going, I mean, this is kind of like the refried beans texture, right? If you wanted that, you can, you can leave it at this point and say, okay, I'm done. Um, Cause sometimes it is nice to have that little bit of texture. I like to get it until it's nice and smooth and creamy, almost like a hummus. Um, and so I, I would keep going and I'm turning up my dial to like a medium. If you have a really big pot, you could also angle it. So you can, you know, you can do this and bring all that mixture to one side. And then you, you'll have it all, sorry, I can't, I'm like, I could only do two hands here. There we go. If you do that, it's all coming to one area. And so you can use your blender at that point to just uh, get it all blended there. So you have more of like a pool that you've created. Now I'm gonna turn it to all the way high. Just a few more clicks here. And 
And if you were to do this in a blender, like a Vitamix, it would be even smoother. Because that'll blend it even smoother than the handheld blender will. But this for me is like super nice. So let me show you what this is looking like. So as you can see, it's a nice smooth consistency, but you can still see the little bits of the black bean skin, which I like. I like that little bit of texture, but it's still kind of smooth and a little bit, I wouldn't say it's runny, like it'll it'll definitely hold up. Like it almost has like the soft peaks, right? Um, so, so this for me is a nice ideal texture for kind of spreading beans on a tostada. Or sometimes what I like to do is like kind of, um, decoratively spread the beans on the plate and then put the rice over it so you can see that layer of the beans black beans the uh, kind of orangey vibrant rice and um and and then whatever you're going to add to it whatever you're going to add on top so any questions about the beans and you can taste for salt at this point and adjust accordingly if you need to because obviously it's a paste so it's going to be really easy to adjust that as needed and so this for me is a the emulsion blender is easier because it's like now all I have to do is clean this thing versus a whole blender cup. So I'm just going to scrape off any excess beans here. It is and so tasty. Yeah, it's so good, right? It's and it's really simple spices and ingredients. Um, but it just it's so complementing with, you know, the rice, especially. And they're going to be kind of like a like a nice marriage because uh, a nice little friendship going there because they have the same spices in them, you know. So they go together so nicely, and the textures work just well. Just super I, nice. I also love what you said, which is you can stop in the middle if you want the texture yeah. of refried beans, or you can go all the way and make it into this glossy paste. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say if you make a even bigger batch of this, you could also use the, um, like a canned chipotle in adobo. Um, and you can maybe, I, so what I personally like to do with chipotles, uh, the ones that are canned in adobo, is I like to open the can. I get the, the bigger ones. I don't get those super teeny tiny cans. I get a slightly bigger one. Like, I don't know how to explain, maybe like a, like a, I don't know, 32 ouncer and I blend it all up in the blender as soon as I open the can. So instead of having individual chipotles in the adobo sauce, I now have like one paste that's all chipotle, right? And so I would add like a tablespoon or two of that paste, the chipotle paste to this. And now you have a black bean dip that you can use for, um, you know, with chips. You can also just add the chipotle and, and have tostadas with a little bit of cheese and you're like good to go. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll say about these beans is that this is also a really nice um, base for a soup. Like if you wanted to have a black bean chipotle soup, you can definitely dilute it with, um, with some more vegetable broth. And if you want to add other elements like veggies and things like that, you could too. But, it, you know, this is definitely not soup consistency. It's more of like a dip or, you know, not quite a refried bean. Um, but this for me is ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside and I'd love to answer any questions you might have about it. And I'm setting it aside mostly because since we're gonna start cooking tortillas, I wanna get my comal on here. Now I'm, I'm just using a cast iron comal that I'm going to heat to uh, a little bit above medium. So I want this to get nice and hot and uh, it's not oiled, like it's just a seasoned um, cast iron. So you can see like I have cooked things in oil here, um, but I'm not adding oil because I'm not going to um, pan fry the tortillas. I want them to cook on a dry surface. You can see my dog in the background playing with her toy in this camera view. <laughs> uh, yeah, Could you let go us ahead. What the rice should be looking at, like right now? Yeah, great question. So let's take a look at that. I have eight minutes left on my timer. So I need to actually turn on my heat. I'm gonna take my lid off. And so right now you can see my rice is getting nice and plump, but there's still a, quite a bit of liquid in here. So I'm gonna turn on my heat slightly and remove my lid. And what you could also do is you can taste some of this rice. So give it a mix. This is different than white rice in that like 
I do mix it because I, I know for a lot of people, it's like, you can't touch the rice until it's done. Don't mix it. I, I mix it. It's fine. I think with the brown rice because the texture is, um, it's not going to break as easily as a white rice will. It holds up. It's pretty firm. Um, and when you're tasting the rice, I, I highly recommend tasting five to 10 grains of rice because the rice that was all the way down at the bottom of this pot is probably more cooked than whatever's at the top. So if you taste at least 10 grains of rice, five to 10, you'll be able to get a better sense of whether your whole entire batch of rice is cooked completely or not. So I am going to keep the lid off because I want a little bit of evaporation to happen. Let me taste these kernels of uh, these grains of rice. It's still a little, a little tough. So it still needs a little bit of time, but not too much more time. So, but this has quite a bit of liquid. So this liquid still needs to get absorbed by the rice. And the other thing that I like to do is once I start to see that it's absorbed a majority of the rice, say, I sorry, the majority of the liquid, like it may have absorbed about 90% or so, like 85, 90% of the liquid, but there's still like a little bit of liquid still remaining. It feels still a, a little bit loose. What I do at that point, especially if I taste the grains like I did now and it tastes like it still needs a little bit more time to cook, but it feels like it's not too much more time, like it's almost there. I turn off the heat and I place the lid on sealed completely and I just leave it off with the lid on and it will continue to cook because the mixture is so hot. And that usually does the trick rather than like trying to cook it with the heat on and like make it work. I have found that that's worked um, many different times to uh, get the rice just right. So is everybody else's rice looking okay? I have a question about rice. Yeah. Um, so sometimes when I make it, because um, usually I make like something similar to this recipe, um, but sometimes my rice, get, especially if I make white rice, it gets too like um, masoso, like a little too wet. Overcooked. Um, so I don't know like what, what makes it that way? Like sometimes it turns out wonderful. And then other times it just turns like two, like just two like thick and stuck to each other. And let me ask you this. Every time that you're making it, are you using a recipe like that is like, it's always like two cups of rice to this much liquid to this much? No. Or are you kind of, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the biggest thing, you know, is like, like when you make the rice the way that you like it, um, know the amount and write it down. Oh, this time I use one and a half cups of white rice with uh, two cups of water or vegetable broth and like this much, this and that. And then that will help you keep it consistent. Cause if you don't, if you're kind of eyeballing, I know like what my mom used to do is like, she would get a bowl, right? So she, say this is like a bowl and she'd be like, oh, okay, I'm gonna put rice. And she'd like put the rice in here and like pour it in the pot. And then she'd just fill up the bowl like two times and was like, and that's it. Um, and that's kind of a like, you know, a, a way to do it, but it doesn't always come out precise unless like you're using the same bowl and it's like, but I would say like, if you have measured amounts, you will yield like this rice that we make for todo verde, um, it would come out pretty consistent time and time again. The only time it would come out inconsistent is if we were making like a batch of a hundred. Uh, so it would be like literally like a huge pot of, of rice. And sometimes the, the heat doesn't transfer all the way properly to the top. And so we'd have like uneven. So we're like, okay, we can't cook a hundred at a time. We have to cook like 50 and 50, like two pots or whatever. But otherwise like it's foolproof every time it comes out right. So um, that would be number one. And, and, and it's probably coming out too clumpy or the, the other times because you're adding a little bit too much liquid um, and it's just, it, it, it could only absorb so much liquid before it's like, oh my God, this is like too much. I'm just going to get soggy now. Um, and so that's probably what's happening. All right. So let's turn it back over to our tortillas. So I haven't added any liquid. It's just been hanging out in the, um, in the bowl. And now I'm going to bring my hand into it. I can see that my cast iron is nice and hot. I'm going to just drop it down to like a medium because it's slightly smoking. Um, and so I'm going to just bring my hand into it and I'm going to, what we call amasar or like uh, knead the dough. So you just want to bring your hand in here. And what you're looking for in this masarina and this dough is a Play-Doh like consistency. 
uh, and one that it, do it doesn't stick to your hand. So if, if you're doing this, what I'm doing, and you have all this masa all stuck to your hand and it's like, oh, it's sticky and it's like, it's, it's stuck, then your masa is too wet. And if it's too wet, you can do two things. You can either add a little bit more of the masarina to it, um, if, especially if like this is still hot to the touch, it'll still um, uh, be able to absorb some of that liquid that's in here. Or the other thing that you can do is if you have time on your hands, you I like to just like spread the masa along the edges of my bowl. So you, essentially you have like a big wide open surface and you just let it stay exposed to the air. And then it's going to kind of like uh, start to feel like a little bit dried out after, you know, like a few minutes. It could be like three to five minutes. It'll start to look like, oh, okay, it's getting a little dried out. And then I, I knead it again, feel it out, and then I spread it out again. And I just keep doing that until I feel like, okay, now this masa feels like it's, um, it doesn't have as much of the moisture in it. Now, if it feels too dry um, in that, the way that you'll know that it's too dry is like, if for example, like right now, I feel like mine is a little bit too dry. And so if I were to make a little ball of masa and I try to make it into a ball using the palms of my hands, and then I try to start opening it up, it immediately starts kind of cracking at the edges. That is likely because it's a little bit too dry. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little touch more of water um, I'm just going to eyeball maybe like another tablespoon or so of water and a little dash of oil. And you can say, okay, I don't want to add any more oil, enough oil. I just want to focus on the water. It's kind of up to you. I, I just want to add a little bit more of like, not just the water to uh, make the masa more pliable. That's my timer for the rice. Um, but you also, I want to add like a little bit more of like that oily moisture that the, um, that the oil will provide to the masarina. So I'm just gonna add a little drizzle of oil and I'm gonna add another touch of the hot water. And I can work that together. That water is hot. Let me actually get my spatula just to be on the safe side here. And I'm just going to start to work that in. Okay, and I'll get my hand in here now that it's kind of mixed in there. And so I can immediately feel that that made a difference with my masa. It feels more moist to the touch. However, it's, I mean, I haven't fully worked it all in, but I have a tiny bit that's got stuck here, but let me make sure it's like all fully incorporated because I only literally needed it or a masarlo like a second. So you can see that my masa is coming together and forming into a dough a lot easier. It looks smoother. It looks a little bit more moist. This is what it's looking like so far. Mine was a bit wet. And so I had to spread it out, like you said. Okay, yeah. So that's a trick. Or if it's still uh, nice and, and uh, hot, you can add a little bit more of your masa in to it. So this for me feels like a good texture. So what I'm again looking for is Play-Doh. So we all remember Play-Doh as kids, right? It's this um, dough that you can easily form, that you can roll into different shapes and sizes. And then now as I'm starting to, to work it in my hand, I don't have as much of that cracking. I could probably add a little bit more moisture to mine because I have a tiny bit of cracking, but you can definitely see that difference from what it looked like earlier, right? I'm gonna add just a touch more and then I'll start working on making the tortillas and showing what that process looks like. Let me go back to the rice for a second. I'm gonna lower my heat even more because I'm feeling like it's starting to, one thing you wanna look out for is that if you're starting to feel it stick to the bottom, you want to avoid that from happening. I feel like a little bit of sticking to the bottom here. And what I find is like when that happens, if I put it on like super low heat, like if it hasn't burned, um, then it should be good to go. So this for me is feeling like it's getting pretty close to the point where I would just turn off the heat and put on the lid. I'm gonna give it like another couple minutes like this and then I will go ahead and um, 
turn it off completely. Right now I put it on pretty low, like just above low on my stove. You can see it's still very hot and bubbling. And I'll give that a few more minutes to uh, keep absorbing and then I'll seal it with the lid. So you can see the difference earlier when I opened it, you could only see liquid and no grains of rice. Now the grains of rice have um, risen to the top because they're definitely clumping up. Okay, so just another tiny dash. I'm gonna add just a little bit more of the water this time. Just another maybe like tablespoon of water and I'll work that in. Let me carefully work that in. And then I should be ready to start showing you how to press the tortillas. And seriously, once you start making handmade tortillas, it's such a game changer, especially for tacos. Um, it just makes all the difference. I still use pre-made tortillas, like if I'm making like enchiladas or if, I, if I'm just like really tired and I, I'm like, I don't have the energy to make handmade tortillas, but I always use Kernel Truth. I don't use any other brand at home uh, for pre-made tortillas. Um, in fact, I don't even know if I would recommend any, to be honest with you. Those are just the ones that I personally prefer. So this masa for me feels like it's ready to go. So let me show you how I work it into a tortilla. So first I'll show you the super simplified version, which is my tortilla press. And if you have one, it's gonna be so easy for you. Let me take a drink of water actually. Okay. So I'm using um, patty wax paper, which is what you use when you're um, when you usually has a burger patty in between. So that's what I'm using. You wanna pinch off like about a walnut size amount of masa and roll it into a ball in the palm of your hand. So just flat hands in the palm, right? Just going back and forth. And then I'll go ahead and put that piece of masa in the center of that piece of wax paper on my uh, press, I'll put another piece of wax paper on top so it's getting sandwiched in between um, uh, the, the metal, right? The tortilla is getting sandwiched in between the wax paper, I'll say. And then I just need to gently press down on the handle and I get this nice even tortilla. Sometimes I like to flip it over. Like if I see a little bit of inconsistency, I'll flip it over and I'll press it again. If I overpress, it will like come out of the sides. And so you should end up with like about like a four or five inch size tortilla. You peel away one side, the top side, and then I put the tortilla on top of my hand with the wax paper facing up and I peel away the other piece of paper. And so then you have the tortilla on your hand and I have that really hot comal. You want, let's head over to there because I just want to show you the way that I put down the tortilla, sometimes I see people just kind of like plop down the tortilla. They're like, ah, and they like, say this was a tortilla in my hand. They just do that. And they're like, ah, right. Or they'll like use both hands. Essentially what you want to do is you want to uh, put one side down. So it kind of sticks a little bit to the comal and then remove your hand, slide your hand out from under it. And this again is like on a medium heat, medium, medium high heat. You want it to be nice and hot. And you're going to give this tortilla about 20 seconds to create a seal, to create a barrier, essentially. So like right now, if I try to move it, uh, it's moving a little bit because it's been on there for a few seconds. Um, but usually it's like at first it's stuck. It takes about 20 seconds. At this point, when you can start to see like, OK, it's, I can move it around, you might be able to go ahead and flip it. And so I'll go ahead and try to see if I can flip mine now. And so you can see I've created a seal where that side is cooked on the tortilla. And it's not cooked all the way through. I've just created a barrier, right? And so I wanna give it another 20 seconds on the second side. And once about 20 seconds go by, I'll flip it back onto the original side and give it about another 20 seconds. Sometimes people kind of flip them back and forth until they puff slightly. You could absolutely do that if you wanted to. Check out this rice, how it's looking, super luscious. Jocelyn, could you also share how to do it without a press? Yes, I'm going to share that. As soon as this one's done cooking, I'll, I'll share that process. 
I'm going to go ahead and turn off my rice and put the lid on and just let it hang out. Let me finish cooking this tortilla just to show that process of cooking it. And then we'll make a couple more together. So I can see a little bit of puffing. I don't know if you can see that on your side, but I have a little air pocket like right here and here that's forming. And so it's starting to kind of puff up and steam in the center. Now I'll say that, ooh, that's getting a nice little steam pocket right there. Um, I'll say that you don't always get um, a steam that happens for all your tortillas. That's totally fine, but it's always nice. You know that it's nice and cooked through. So the other thing that I'll say for tortillas and tacos is the side that puffs, which is generally um, the second side. That, that So this is the original side that touched the pan, right? And then I, I flipped it and then this is the side that's kind of puffing up. Generally, this side is where you would put like your fillings. It's called um, the pancita because it's the, the little belly that rises. And uh, usually the, the first side that touched your um, comal is a little bit more thick. And this side is a little bit more thin because it had like the, the steam. Um, and so you, put, you would put whatever you want to fill your taco with on the pancita side. Um, is kind of the name of the game, right? And let me grab a towel. And you wanna have a towel handy to just place your tortilla in a towel and just cover it. You could put it in a tortilla holder and it'll help steam it. And so the other thing I'll say with tortillas as we start working on the second one is that even if your tortilla feels like, oh, maybe I overcooked it a little bit, it feels a little bit hard, or maybe I'm not sure if it's cooked all the way through. By the time you stack all your tortillas together in that in that towel, once they're cooked, they're gonna steam and they're gonna keep each other nice and hot. And any of the ones that feel hard are gonna soften because of the steam. And any of the ones that feel undercooked are going to cook all the way through because of the steam. So um, just do the 20, 20, 20 second rule and you should yield um, uh, some, some pretty decent tortillas. So now let's show the other process that we were just talking about with the Pyrex or the baking dish. So again, if you don't have a flat surface, make sure you put a cutting board down just so you don't get any grout shapes or any weird shapes um, in your tortilla. And I am going to just go directly on my counter because it is flat. I'm gonna place my piece of wax paper. I'm gonna grab that sort of walnut size bit of masa and roll it in my hands, just in the palm of my hands as you can see here. Place that tortilla masa down place the other piece of wax paper on top. And then I'm gonna grab my baking dish or your other cutting board. And you're just going to use literally your weight to press down. So I press down in the center and then I, for this round dish, I like it because I can kind of like, I'm doing this motion on the tortilla. So, and I can see everything that's happening. So I'm like, oh, okay, it's turning into a nice round shape. Or sometimes you can see like, okay, it's kind of off. Let me adjust here. Let me spread the masa this way or that way. And so as you can see, it's taking a little bit more time to get the same size. And, and this might also, unless you really are generous with your time here per tortilla, you might find that you have a thicker uh, tortilla that is not as large. It's more thick than it is big in diameter. So, you can see that tortilla here. Again, I would peel away the top side, flip it over so the tortilla is on my hand, and then peel away the other layer of the wax paper or the plastic or whatever it is that you're using. Now this one starts to get all these like little ridges in it. You can kind of piece it together if you see any rips or tears. It's pretty forgiving. It's again like Play-Doh, so you can mold it if you need to. And then I'm gonna go over to my comal and I'm going to place it down same way as we did earlier. So one side touches and I just remove my hand away. Make sure it's all touching. 20 seconds on this first side. So this tortilla isn't as cute, I would say. It has more texture, but that, I mean, it gives it character, right? So it's just a, a little bit, a different type of tortilla. So about 20 seconds, and then you might see like mine, I still can't move it, it's stuck. 
but once that seal is created, I'll be able to move it across my comal a little bit more easily. So it's still not ready for me yet to flip it. Oh, and now it's getting there. All right. So there we are. It has a Pyrex on there. So it's a branded tortilla. Because <laughs> um, it had, it said, sorry about that. It had a, a Pyrex label on the bottom of the, of the, um, of the dish. So again, yeah. another 20 seconds on this side and then I'll flip it back over again. And, and you're somebody, have, go ahead. You don't have to put any oil or anything on the kamal to- That is correct. So no oil, uh, it should be a dry kamal or a dry skillet or a pan, um, you know, whatever, whatever you prefer to cook your tortillas in, but no oil. So you're not pan frying, it's all dry. All right, so I'm going to flip it over to the original side. I don't think that this one's going to puff because it has so many like ridges that were created. Maybe because I was um, pushing my weight a little bit forward. So the paper created all these little ridges in the, this doesn't always happen when I do that with the um, Pyrex, but it happened today. So, oh, actually I have a little puffing. So it's still, it's still working out. Mine looks very similar with all the wrinkles. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it may very well happen. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and add this tortilla with the other and fold it in a towel together. And then let's make another one together and then we'll check out how our rice is looking. My rice still might need a few more minutes to finish up. So it might not you know, be 100% complete. Like we're actually over time, but, um, but you'll get a sense of what it's looking like. I'm going to make one more with the tortilla press. You saw the labor it took to make the tortilla with the Pyrex or with the cutting board. It's possible. It just is a little, a little bit different of a process. So again, always important, make sure that you're using the wax paper, plastic, something to create a barrier. And then I have my masa rolling it into a ball. And the other thing I'll say about this masa is, um, it holds well in the in the fridge or the freezer. Um, mostly the fridge I would prefer rather than the freezer. If you don't want to make all your tortillas today and you want to put it away, put it in an airtight bag. So like a bag that you can tie. So you would make sure that it's all in a ball together and then tie the bag up to the ball of masa so that no air is is really touching it. And that'll help uh, help it keep. Um, I personally prefer to just make all my tortillas. So I'm probably gonna just make all the tortillas right now. And then I prefer to already have cooked tortillas in my fridge rather than the masa itself. So, you know, it's kind of up to you what you personally prefer. And you can also freeze those tortillas too. So you can see how much um, more smooth of a process I have here if I'm using the press. So again, removing the top layer of the plastic or the parchment, whatever you're using, add the tortilla to your hand and peel away the, the other layer of the paper. And then we'll bring this to the comal, lay it flat down, and it's going to cook for 20 seconds on that first side. Like right now, it's still stuck. I can't move it and, and I'm not moving, uh, pushing into this enough where I would like indent my fingers. I'm just doing a very soft, like, can I move this? Um, and it's, it's not budging yet. So it needs a little bit of time. And then once that seal is created, and of course you can use a spatula if you need to, like if the heat is too much, you can absolutely use a spatula. Um, just not tongs. I've had people ask if they can use tongs. I wouldn't recommend it because the dough, the masa is like so pliable and soft, you'll likely puncture it with tongs. So a spatula would be the best uh, option. And you're not you opening it till it has a lot of brown bits on it. It's just lightly toasted, isn't it? Exactly. And sometimes, honestly, like it's not even toasted. Sometimes it'll just be the seal. So the first one was like a nice example where like it didn't have any brown uh, on it. It was just just the seal of the cooked corn. 
and then I flipped it. And then when I flipped it back to the original side um, in the last uh, moments of cooking, then it did kind of brown a little bit. So, so yeah, you don't need to cook it until you get all the brown brown bits of it. And if you find that your pan is a little bit too hot, like maybe it's uh, overcooking it before it's uh, creating the seals and it's just kind of burning it, you can just uh, bring your temperature down. It should feel hot. Like you should, you know, if you have your hand over it, I mean, I have my hand maybe about like two, three inches above and I, I feel the heat and I could probably hang out here for like about 30 seconds and I'm like, okay, that's too hot now. Um, but it shouldn't feel like, oh, oh my gosh, like even it's, it's so hot that it's smoking or that I, I feel like I'm going to burn myself because it's so incredibly hot. It's like a nice steady heat. All right. When you have so, um, too many tortillas, how would you recommend to store them? Like like once you've already made them, how, how would you store them? Yeah, so the way that I would store them is, you know, similar to how you buy tortillas, they're gonna be in a, in a bag, a plastic bag that'll help them from uh, getting stale uh, or, or over drying. So you definitely wanna put them in a bag um, and seal it. And then you could freeze them. You can um, have them in your fridge and just uh, reheat them. Sometimes when I find that they, when I'm reheating them and they might feel a little bit hard because they were in the fridge or a little dried out. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll either spray or splash a little bit of water um, on the tortillas and then put them on the comal to reheat. And that helps to kind of create a little bit of pliability. So um, for Tupperware, I mean, if, you, if there's like enough of them in there and they feel kind of airtight, I would use Tupperware. But otherwise I actually do use like plastic bags for this. Um, and you could use like reusable plastic bags. Like I have like, um, oh, I think I might be using them, but they're, they're those like reusable, like gallon size, um, like a Ziploc. Uh, and you, you know, after you use them, you can wash them. So you can do something like that. And that kind of helps to create like an airtight seal. So that's just my personal preference. So let's head back over to the rice. I turned off my uh, rice a little bit ago and it's still continue to cook with no heat. As you can see, it's like super steaming here. And I would let this probably still sit for another like 10 minutes or so, but you can see it has like a good amount of moisture to it. That'll continue to absorb if you let this hang out here. And again, like with, with no heat on, it's just, uh, just the heat that is still in the pot from the rice cooking. And again, you, you'll want to taste about like 10 grains of rice to see if it's cooked through, but it is going to feel a little bit moist. This for me feels a little bit still just a touch too moist, but I would eat that in a second, to be honest with you, like that amount of moisture looks really good to me. Like if this is cooked through, I will eat this right now, but usually it's, it's a little bit more dry. Like it's absorbed a little bit more liquid. And actually my rice is cooked through, so. I will eat this right now. <laughs> uh, it, still so, a little chewy. Is that, it still feels a little chewy. Is that because? I was about to uh, mention that. Yeah. So and is uh, that because it's brown rice versus white rice? White rice tends to be soft. Exactly. So it is going to have a bite to it. So it'll feel tender like it's cooked through, but it has a little bit of a chewy bite to it. And that's just the nature of brown rice. Um, especially the short grain, because it's like uh, little grains and they're kind of plump. They'll have a little bit of a bite to them, which I personally love because I think it makes the rice feel even more exciting for me. Um, so yes, that is true. Same thing goes like if you're using, I use black rice as well that I, I, I mostly use for like um, um, arroz con leche, which is like a, um, a rice porridge, like a dessert that we eat in Mexico and I use black rice instead of white rice, and it has more of a chew and a bite to it, um, but I'm okay with that personally. I don't mind that texture. I, it's not for everyone, but I, I think the flavor and the, and the texture is like more playful in the dish for me. Agreed. So, yeah. So that's what I have for you all today. We made our rice. I can go back and show you if you wanna look at it. We, we have our beans. We have our tortillas ready to go. I actually have some mole in my fridge. So I'm going to warm up some mole and have a feast right now. Um, but I hope that you all enjoyed this class. And um, if you have any questions or anything that I didn't answer, Sarah, do you see anything here?
Everything's good. Okay, great. And if any other questions? Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, later, if anything comes up, please feel free to reach out. You can always email us. Um, you can send us DMs, take pictures of your food, show us how it's looking. Uh, and, and I hope that you enjoy these dishes and share it with your friends and family. It's gonna, it's, it's definitely like us getting excited about our same food again. So I hope that it did that for you today.